Downtown Naperville is synonymous with great shops, restaurants, and the crown jewel, the Riverwalk. But 50 years ago, the DuPage River flowed through a downtown centered on getting business done. Downtown was a destination more out of necessity. There were no malls and no online retailers that delivered your heart's desire to your front door. It was a Naperville barely recognizable from today. We are very small. Uh, but growing community. We are a farming community. So even though most of the business, if you will, the activity and the agriculture was outside of Naperville, you still had your grocery stores, you still had clothing like department stores, your drug store. You were going downtown to you know, get your necessities. It's really the farmers who have the, the cars and uh, they, bring their, they, they bring, bring their car into town and they're gonna park it, but they're gonna walk around and do their shopping and have their afternoon to do their business in town. There's a lot of them with just one car in the family, but uh, there's a lot of ladies that didn't drive. Uh, my mother-in-law, you know, she never drove. Uh, lived in town right on Chicago Avenue and she'd want something, she'd walk downtown and get it. Jefferson Avenue was the central hub of downtown. City Hall oversaw Naperville from its location on the south side of Jefferson. There was City Meat Market, Tasty Bakery, Oswald's Pharmacy, and Broker's Department Store. All stores that carry a lasting legacy of serving Naperville residents from the center of downtown. But at one time, they all shared downtown Naperville with six automobile dealerships. You didn't have the Fox Valley, you didn't have shopping centers. Uh, so all the, the businesses, uh, all the businesses were downtown. So being in the automobile business, you wanted to be where the action was. And that's where the action was downtown. Netsley's was located at the corner of Washington and Chicago, where River Square hosts restaurants and shops. Burgess Service Station operated Kitty Corner from Netsley's, where it had been a Kaiser Fraser dealership until the mid 1950s. It's now Jimmy's Bar and Grill. Huff Chevrolet, just south of the river on Washington, was owned by the Huffstetler family until it was purchased by Angelo Aguizio. In 1965, it was the first dealership to leave downtown when it moved to Ogden Avenue. Cromer Motor Company sold Fords at the corner of Chicago and Maine, its currently Sullivan Steakhouse. Across the street, Brummel Motor Company overlooked the river, selling and servicing Buicks until 1961 when it became Colonial Motor Sales. Kohler Dodge sat in the middle of downtown on Main Street, now Giordano's. The dealerships also looked far different from those of today. In the small space available, the downtown dealers made do with what they had. Back in those days, none of the dealers had excess parking. If we had, um, we had 20 cars in inventory, that was a lot. People didn't want a car uh, that was sitting on the lot for several months or, or weeks or whatever. Uh, they wanted something fresh from, from the factory, you know, it's just like picking a tomato fresh out of the garden. Each dealership sold exclusively through one automobile company or another, developing loyal customers through good service and selling cars that became iconic symbols of the times. Ford, Chevrolet, Dodge, Pontiac, Chrysler, Oldsmobile, Buick. If my dad drove a Buick, I drove a Buick. Families drove the similar cars. I had customers of several generations that drove, you know, Pontiacs or, or Buicks or whatever that we were selling at the time. So cars can start to reflect who you are in a very different kind of a way than it had been even before World War II. Cars were the epitome of technological advancement in the 1960s and 70s, the iPhones of their day. And just as a new iPhone brings people out in droves to see a new one, the arrival of a new Ford, a new Chevy, a new Dodge was something exciting. Every year there was a model change. Uh, dealers covered their windows and all that stuff, and it was a big celebration. Everybody was anxious. Everybody was anxious to see the what the new models look like, and the, and the cars changed from year to year. I can remember as a kid, hurrying, getting down out of high school, going down past the dealers and see in the window if you could see one of the new ones. You can tell a 1955 Buick from a 56 Buick, a 57, and they all changed. Same as Chevrolets and Pontiacs. They were all different. They changed every year. You don't have that excitement that there was of the, you know, spotlights going at night and, and uh, 
the showing of the uh, new car and streamers and banners and, and it is it's, it's gone that that fun part of it is gone Naperville benefited from the sales tax revenue generated by large car purchases but being located downtown meant being part of the community and dealerships contributed more than just taxes to the welfare of Naperville I was born and raised in this whole area so I mean obviously Naperville was our my, my main attraction, and it was a wonderful town to work in, I'll be honest with you. I think there were pillars of the community, and I think they were very um, philanthropic. I mean, people were having fundraisers, uh, cars were raffled or given away. They looked to them as the downtown businesses, like they would have Oswalds or, or brokers. Local newspapers were brimming with ads for both the dealerships as well as the service stations in town. These ads were the first source of information for the savvy car buyer. After researching all you could, only then did you go in, check out the car, and kick the tires. Today you go onto the internet and you get a good look at, at a car and you close up on parts of the car and the, the description. If we're talking about 40, 50 years ago, that's something that you could certainly get in a magazine and you'll certainly have people that will be waiting with the information that they're getting from reading in magazines and newspapers. After a home, a car is the second largest purchase most families will ever make. And in the 60s and 70s, a decision that important fell along traditional gender roles. The husband or the father of the house, you know, would select the car that they were going to buy. Mom could dictate the color many times. People always looked forward to, you know, buying a new car. That was, you know, that was always a, a big, a big thing uh, for a family. And I remember my father going in with a piece of paper, and he knew what he wanted and what he was going to pay. And that was probably the only thing in the consumer market that you could actually deal with. You know, you, when maybe your house, you could probably ask for a little less, but when you went in to buy a broom, you bought the broom. You didn't try to haggle for the broom. Even before the dealer could hand over the keys, there was still work to be done on a new car. It was called a service. When the car came out of the lot, well, to start with, the floor mats weren't in, the antennas weren't on them, the carpeting, every, and hubcaps, everything was in the trunk. And then the mechanics would get the car, lay the carpeting. If it had a radio, put the, put the radio in it, put the hubcaps on it. Nine out of 10 of them didn't have a mirror and everybody wanted a mirror. I mean, there's no such thing as going in at nine o'clock and at 12 o'clock driving home a new car. That just didn't happen. Owning a car is more than just buying it. Once the car left the lot, it needed to be fueled, maintained, and repaired. Chevrolet had their own engines, Pontiac had their own engine, Buick had their own engines, Oldsmobile had their own, and Cadillac. The only thing that was interchangeable and that was in, in them was the gas. Cars required a lot of upkeep, yeah, and you had, uh, again, a very personal relationship with a local repairman, mm -hmm. and uh, service, uh, the service station was a critical part of the whole operation. I'd say eight out of ten ladies, I'd rather talk to them when they're having a problem with their car than their husband, because the husband seems to think he knows all the answers. Neighborville dealers and mechanics took pride in their work and worked hard for their living. They never cut corners, and they never stooped to the bad reputations of other car dealers and mechanics outside of Naperville. Nobody gets their toes stepped on, and you're not giving somebody else a black eye. There's enough to go around for everybody, and if you work together, it's, it's easy, and the customer comes out ahead. I've, I've sent a lot of repairs back to the dealers where they got them for free because it was a warranty repair. We could have charged them, and, and no, you know, I don't gain anything in the long run by it. I gain a customer for, for taking care of them. But, uh, and that's always been our, our advertising, is trying to take care of the people. And, do it right. Like my dad always taught me, do it right the first time, second time you do it for free. I, I had this place set up that there was not one job I could not do. When my one, one main mechanic was on uh, vacation, I'd run the front end alignment rack. I'd do the air conditionings, I'd do the tune-ups, I'd do the brake work. It was not above me if we got a call for somebody's up in the toll way with a flat tire or out of gas. I'd just jump in the other truck and just buzz up and take care of it. It's the way I ran the business. I mean, I was an active dealer. I wore a white shirt, but I tell you, the, the laundry guy a bit felt like strangling me more than once because my shirts didn't last very long. 
Things began to change in the 1970s. An oil embargo hit the nation, sending fuel prices skyward. To get gasoline was really difficult. I mean, I know a lot of people accuse us of a lot of things, but believe me, when we had the gas in the ground and we paid for that money out of our pocket, we wanted just to sell it. We wanted our money back as fast as we could get it. Americans began looking for more fuel-efficient vehicles to better cope with the rising price of gas. New, compact, and affordable foreign imports began to flood the market. A recession hit soon after, and downtown Naperville suffered. The arrival of Fox Valley Mall in nearby Aurora did not help the struggling downtown. The Central Area Naperville Development Organization, or Can Do, was founded to revitalize the struggling downtown. Downtown was looking to reinvent itself as a shopper's paradise. The population of the small farming community had exploded since 1970, almost doubling with each decade. As Naperville began to reinvent itself following the recession, Robert Van Eyten saw the writing on the wall for downtown dealerships. He purchased five acres far west of downtown, on Ogden Avenue, setting the stage for more and more dealerships moving into the area outside of downtown. See, in downtown, basically you had primarily local traffic, whereas out here, you had traffic that drove up and down Ogden Avenue all the way from Oswego and Yorkville and, and all those towns and, and people from Downers Grove and all that. So you had, it, it, exposed, it exposed us to a much, much larger market. You're going to have more, more variety, more colors, more models. So you need more space uh, to display those cars and the volume is just going to be much higher. It really speaks to how big Naperville, but also the surrounding region, is, is growing in terms of a market for cars and capturing that broader market. The dealerships all left downtown by the early 80s, leaving room for new stores and restaurants. The construction of the Riverwalk sparked a second renaissance for downtown, leading to the shopper's paradise Naperville business owners always believed their city could become. Car dealerships continue to thrive in Naperville, only now there are even more of them, all along Dealer Row on Ogden Avenue and Aurora Avenue, where you can find almost any make and model car. The original dealership's place in Naperville's downtown history has been immortalized in stained glass. Cars of the Century decorates the front of the parking deck on Van Buren Avenue, forever making these families and dealers a part of downtown. <laughs>